All right. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, good evening. My name is Muhammad Bashir, uh, uh, and this is the Freedom Fighters with DMV show on WBGR uh, Network Online Radio. Welcome to the show. For those of you who are uh, Muslims, Assalamu alaikum. For those of you who are not Muslims, peace and blessings be with you. And I hope you enjoy the show this evening. This evening is a uh, uh, I have along with me my main man who's going to be my conscience for the night make sure he holds me down because this kind of a show will get me fired up. This is James Tarek Lang, uh, a giant in our community. He's involved in construction, also involved in working in the prisons and uh, educating and uplifting uh, young minds and, and ab absolutely holding down older minds like mine. So just all welcome him and inshallah uh, we'll have a nice round discussion. Those of you who want to participate in the discussion, remember this show is hosted by our brother here, uh, Sharif Shafi. He's out this evening, so that gives me the opportunity to host again for this evening. Those of you who have heard me before know that I have my own podcast. It's called The Raw Law Project. I'm a retired criminal trial lawyer, uh, 28 years of experience. You don't know a case that I haven't tried, uh, the nature of it. Um, I'm also now an author, so here's a shameless plug in case you wanted to know whether or not it was coming. It is. Uh, this is uh, my old book. It's called Raw Law, an Urban Guide to Criminal Justice. You can go get it at mbashirspeaks.com. And this is my latest book, April 4th, Lessons on Living and Dying. You can also get it at Ambassador Speaks. I promised you my that my other book, which is hot on the presses, would be out uh, two weeks ago. But unfortunately, we had some snags. That one's called uh, America and Blackface, Lesson, uh, which is uh, Essays and Criticisms of Black Leadership. And I think you're going to enjoy that. Uh, if you enjoyed Raw Law and you enjoy April 4th, this one is much harder uh, there because I think we need to be much more critical in our communities as to what it is that's going on. Which is why this particular topic tonight, Eric Gardner and Beyond, is one that is dear to my heart. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, and I, I don't know why um, you don't know, Eric Gardner was a young, uh, well, father, uh, man in uh, Staten Island, New York, uh, June 17th, uh, five years ago, five years ago this week, he was uh, approached by six, seven police officers who alleged that he was selling loose cigarettes. Um, I don't know why that subject led to an arrest, uh, because loose cigarettes is at best a misdemeanor. Uh, um, so it should subject you at best maybe a traffic ticket, I mean a, 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 a citation as opposed to an arrest, but they decided they were going to arrest him. Um, he was placed into a chokehold by uh, a police officer and he was taken down. He was piled on by these six or seven police officers. They compressed his chest, his throat, and he's, those of us who don't know, know the expression, I can't breathe. Uh, according to reports and according to the tape that we had opportunity to review, he said, I can't breathe nearly 11 times. The question was whether or not anyone would be tried, anyone would be charged in his death. No one is, has been charged and no one will be charged. The Attorney General, the United States Attorney General, uh, William Barr, uh, Trump's right-hand man, stepped in two days ago, three days ago, before uh, uh, a, a, a particular court order giving sanctions to New York and to uh, the United States Attorney's Office and announced that there would be no prosecutions in this matter. Those of us who saw the tape, we know exactly what happened. It's not hard. Um, but this is what I'm going to do is I'm going to address the law and then I'm going to address what I always do. I'm going to address social context so that you all get an understanding as to what's going on. The last time I spoke to you, I discussed whether or not you were an American. And so I'm going to stick with that theme as I address this here. Eric Gardner this case, the uh, prosecutor indicated that the reason why they were not prosecuting anyone is that they could not prove the case. They didn't believe it had sufficient evidence to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. That's your first smokescreen. Those of you who know me know that in 28 years of criminal trial work, you learn the intricacies of being able to maneuver the community and maneuver people's mentality. First of all, uh, the standard for beyond a reasonable doubt is only a trial jury standard, meaning first, before you do anything, you get an investigation. When that investigation is done, if you're a prosecutor, you present that investigation to a grand jury. 
the grand jury is the one who determines whether or not there's sufficient evidence to charge someone. Sufficient evidence. Not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Sufficient evidence in a grand jury simply means that if your grand jury is composed of 25 people, 13, that is a majority, has to decide whether or not there's sufficient evidence to charge someone. And that's really what the issue is. So when a prosecutor steps up and said they couldn't prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, they would not know that unless they present it to a jury during a trial. So when they say beyond a reasonable doubt, you know that's smoke, that's smoke and mirrors, you know that that's something that's, uh, 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 they, they're pulling the wool over your eyes. And, but now, nowadays, there's, that's nothing new. When you look at the history, this is what they do in the black community when they don't want to uh, prosecute a police officer, a protector of their, of their power. Uh, what do I mean when I say a grand jury? A grand jury is composed in most jurisdictions in New York, I think it's 25 citizens. The prosecutor has an obligation in order for you, anyone to stand trial on a case in New York or under the Constitution, under the Sixth Amendment, a matter has to be presented to the grand jury for an indictment. An indictment is a formal charge. When you present a matter to a grand jury, you're just presenting sufficient evidence to establish that there's probable cause, a reasonable belief that a crime was committed. Now, let's assume that the family and all of us wanted a murder charge. They may not be able to get murder because the murder is an intentional killing of someone. All right? When you intend to kill someone, you set out to kill someone, and you actually do it, that's murder. So they may not have been able to present that to a grand jury and even get an indictment. But if you're in the state of New York, you have two levels here. You have the state of New York, and you have the federal government that handles civil rights violations. In the state of New York, there's a statute for murder. And underneath the statute of murder, which they may not have been able to get an indictment for, is also the idea of manslaughter or criminally negligent homicide. Criminally negligent homicide means that you have a duty to the particular person that you are attempting to arrest. Or you come across someone and you act in a way that has reckless disregard for that particular person's life, or you act in a manner that demonstrates that you uh, are going about to breach a duty that you have to that particular person. That makes you negligent, and that negligent comes with a criminal intent, that you intend to do something, and you do it in a manner that is so negligent that you therefore can be charged with criminally negligent homicide. Now let's take that just for a minute. Let's assume that I wanted to charge these officers and I was going to the grand jury. The first thing I would want to do is I would want to present evidence of the death. So therefore I got an autopsy, I got a medical examiner who's saying three things in that autopsy. One, the person is dead. He therefore labels it a homicide because a homicide is a death caused by the person of another. Another person causes your death, it's a homicide. Second thing is I want to present evidence that uh, as to what the manner of death was to be able to establish that what they did was negligent. He was placed in what's commonly referred to as a chokehold. If you watch the video, you'll see the officer, Officer Lavodi, I believe his name is. Is it Lavodi? No. Ah, whatever his name is. He walks up behind him, he puts his right arm underneath Mr. Gardner's right arm, like an arm bar, and then he snatches him around his neck and his throat the other way and locks his arms. He then drags him backwards. That means he's pushed an immediate pressure on his throat area. That's called a chokehold. It is a classic chokehold. In New York, there was a case in 1994 with Anthony, a young man named Anthony Bias was placed in a chokehold. That's where I got Lavodi from. Uh, Lavodi was the uh, officer who put him in that chokehold. He choked him. The kid died. He had asthma. He was he cut off his breath. He died. He was not charged in, in the state of New York, actually he was charged in the state of New York. He went, as they always do, found a judge trial, no jury, and he was acquitted. The feds, the federal government, picked up the case as a violation of his civil rights. But what they did, when they charged, what they talked about this particular chokehold. So if you're in New York, again, you have a president, case president, where you have established that the chokehold is a negligent act. 
it's an, an and even more so now because immediately following the death of Anthony Bias in 1994, they passed a law and a statute and a police department directive indicating that the chokehold is illegal. It's unlawful for you to use as a police officer. So therein lies your first prong of determining whether or not a person is negligent. You want to establish that he's doing something that is separate and apart from what is the norm against this particular person. And so therefore, if he's acting outside of the norm, he is acting negligently. What do I mean by that? Let's assume I want to arrest you and I walk up and I wrap a rope around your neck. There's no need for you to wrap a rope around my neck in order to arrest me. What you do is you handcuff me. You may even tackle me. You may take me down and put my hands behind my back. Yes. But the minute you go for the throat with an illegal or an unlawful or an unsanctioned action, you have now acted negligently. You have moved past the standard of care that is required on that particular person. So you can prove that prong, at least some evidence of that prong, for the purposes of a grand jury. You have a death. You have negligence, you have now criminally negligent homicide that can be indicted. But he wasn't indicted. And by the way, my understanding that in that particular neighborhood, the person who was in charge of that indictment during that time frame for Mr. Garner was, I believe it was Loretta Lynch, who became an Obama appointment. Uh, but that's just me. Uh, now, what does that do? What, is it, what, what, what does that say about uh, uh, criminal justice? You now move from the state who say we're not going to charge to the Fed. The federal government at that point was the Obama administration. The attorney general on that side of the case was Eric Holder. Loretta Lynch, Eric Holder. Loretta Lynch succeeds Eric Holder in the criminal justice system as the United States attorney once Eric Holder retires. But it's my understanding from all the reports that I've read that Eric Holder wanted to indict or at least he thought he could indict so he referred the matter to the United States Attorney's Office in New York and then they had a squabble the United States Attorney versus uh, the, the Justice Department versus the Civil Rights Division the Criminal Division versus the Civil Rights Division one arguing yes we have enough evidence one arguing we don't have enough evidence so it languished so that means that this black prosecutor did not indict in the death of this black man now I say that like that not to get you fired up over the racial implications of it, except that you understand the racial implications of it. Because we have a history in America of those who have the privilege of being accepted into the halls of power always side with the halls of power to the detriment of the masses of black people. It has existed since Reconstruction. It may even existed before Reconstruction. Some of the greatest eugenicists in the United States weren't just Margaret Sangler. They were some of the most profound and most popular black intellectuals that were of, of that particular time. Thinking that, well, there was a class of black people that didn't deserve to reproduce, or that they were an unfit class, or that they were from, how did the boys label uh, Marcus Garvey? Um, uh, uncommon stock. But the mentality still permeates itself now. That there are some people who we don't want to shake the power uh, our, our perceived power by defending them. So, that's where we exist as it relates to this particular case. In the Fed, once the matter is turned over to the Fed, they have a different statute. You now already know that there was enough evidence there for you to indict in the state, but they chose not to. So they moved the matter on to the Fed. So for five years it languished with the Fed. Now, could the Fed have indicted? There's a statute, you all can look it up, 18 U.S.C. 242, the color of the law statute. It's a civil rights violation, a criminal civil rights violation for you acting under the color of the law to violate anybody's right, anybody's right under a statute of the Constitution, an ordinance, or anything like that as you are acting under the color of the law. So, in order for you to establish that to the satisfaction of a grand jury and get uh, 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 an indictment, because really this is what we're talking about. No, they're talking about no one is even going to be charged. So what we're just talking about is getting an indictment. For you to establish that and get an indictment, what do you have to have? You have to establish that the person who did the choking or did the acting or did the arresting was un 
operating under the color of law. Under the color of law means he's a police officer. He's acting in the performance of a police uh, activity. There were at least seven of them acting in the performance of a police activity. The autopsy demonstrated that this was compression to this young man's throat, that there was compression to this young man's chest that caused an asthmatic attack that he could not recover from. Now, when we talked about negligence earlier, what happens when someone says to you, I can't breathe? Let's assume they say it once. You're a trained police officer. They say it twice. If you listen to the tape, listen for the background noises of the citizens. Because by the time he says it twice, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, they have already picked up that he's in distress. But the seven officers who are laying on top of him, compressing his chest and his throat to the ground, don't pick it up. That demonstrates a reckless disregard for the value of human life. And therefore, the seizure of him is unreasonable. There are two prongs in the federal statute. Whether or not the conduct of the police officer acting in the, in the, under the color of law was unreasonable and willful. Now their argument is that it was not willful. They couldn't prove willfulness. So let's deal with unreasonable first. The first one is you got seven officers arrest somebody for selling cigarettes. It's not like he's selling truckloads of cigarettes. We're talking about Lucy's. For those of you who know that's like a, you go into a pack, you pull out one, you sell it for a dollar. You sell it for 50 cents because someone on the street wants to buy a cigarette. So the approach him as it relates to arrest like that might be to a lay person somewhat unreasonable. And remember, when you're talking to a grand jury, you're talking to lay people. You're not talking about uh, 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 legal scholars. You're talking about lay people. What do you think about this is what you're asking him in the grand jury. Do you think this is reasonable to approach him? Secondly, do you think it's reasonable to approach him with seven officers over something like loose cigarettes? Thirdly, do you think it's reasonable to approach him and grab him from behind to place him under arrest in an unreasonable chokehold? So therefore, you have now established, if you, to a matter of a jury, you just need 13 out of the 25 to agree that, you know what, that might be unreasonable. Do you think you could maybe find that that was unreasonable? Just those little facts. And here he is, he's saying, look, what are you bothering me for? What are you doing? What am I doing? That's what he's saying. And so they say, we're going to arrest you, we're going to arrest you. He's like, for what, for what, for what? Boom, they take him down. Now let's talk about willful. The chokehold helps you demonstrate that it's not anything but intentional. Willful means a specific intent to do an injustice, to do harm. A specific, you have to have the intent to do it, to do exactly what you did. And that is to use excessive force. Anytime, like I said, if I were to walk up to you to place you under arrest and throw a rope around your neck, that's exactly what I intended to do. But that would not be reasonable and it would be willful. It would be a specific intent on my part to use excess force against you. If I walked up to you and just said, I'm going to place you under arrest. I thought I saw you walk across the street. And for walking across the street, I decided to punch you in your mouth. That's going to be my way of then placing you under arrest. That's willful. I know that's what my intention is, to punch you in the mouth. So if I know that a chokehold is unlawful, it, even if it's just something that's New York policy, that you can't do it, and I do it anyway, then I am doing it willfully. When I take you down on a chokehold and hold you down, I'm doing it willfully. Now, as he's saying, I can't breathe, and these other officers are piling on top of him, alleging that they're trying to get his hands behind his back, he's saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And they're ignoring him. What could be more unreasonable and willful with a specific intent to use excessive force against him than something along that line? What could be more? I don't think you can get more, but at least you can get that to a grand jury. Let's assume you can't prove it at a trial. Maybe a jury sits back and they say, I don't think it was unreasonable. But to a grand jury, see a jury has to be unanimous in a criminal trial. But at the grand jury, you only have to have one person vote more than the other people. So if your, jur your grand jury is 15, you get eight people to agree you got an indictment. Now, why is that important? Those of us who are in the criminal justice system, and you mm -hmm. do prison, right? Yes. You know that these indictments, they overcharge, especially if you're black, mm -hmm. and then they plead you at what they really think you did. Right. Because that's what puts the pressure on you. I'm facing 25 years for this particular crime, mm -hmm. and they offer me five. Yo, wait a minute, I got a decision right. to make. Right. And that's the dilemma that we are in each and every day. We got mandatory minimums for drug offenses. I got uh, uh, three vials of crack cocaine. 
So instead of it just being simple possession, they say, no, I thought I saw him hand those off. So I'm going to charge him with possession, possession with intent, possession with intent within a thousand feet of a school, possession with intent within 500 feet of a park, and possession with intent within a thousand feet of a school comes with a mandatory five years in prison, top number of 10, mandatory five. And then they offer you a plea to possession. Possession comes with probation to three. You think you're going to take that? Oh, you're going to jump on that with both feet. You're right. going to jump on it with my feet. You're going to borrow my shoes to jump on that. Right. And that's exactly what they do in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. So you put the pressure on them by gaining that indictment. Right. Cops never have that pressure on them, especially in some place like in, in a case like this. Right. But it speaks volumes of three things. The people in power, whether they be black or white, do not value, did not value the life of Eric Gardner. The people who originally approached him didn't value his life. The people who had the uh, immediate ability to do justice to him and his family didn't value his life. That includes the prosecutor, that includes the two attorney generals, both of whom were black, and that includes William Barr, the, 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 the Trump appointee who now has the case. That's the Eric Gardner case. 